reaction enthalpies and bond dissociation energy. We'll be looking at the relationship between those two in this lesson. Uh, this is a whole chapter on organic reactions and mechanisms, and we'll start off by kind of doing a review of thermodynamics as it applies to organic reactions, and then kinetics as well, both topics you've seen uh, back in the day in general chemistry. Uh, and then we'll kind of introduce organic reactions properly, and we'll look at what are called mechanisms, which kind of show the, the order of steps, the sequence of steps in which bonds are broken and bonds are formed, and the associated energy changes for both. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad. Welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to make science both understandable and hopefully even enjoyable. Now, this is my new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so we're going to start with a review of reaction enthalpy. And you might recall from Gen Chem that reaction enthalpy is delta H of a reaction. And uh, you're really going to have one of two situations, either one where your reactant has to increase in energy to get to your products. That's reaction where we need to absorb enthalpy, if we say, we'll say. And in that case, we'll refer to that as being endothermic. So and in this case, as we go from reactant to product, we'll be gaining heat or gaining enthalpy, we say. And so delta H is gonna be a positive number. Now the alternative here is where your reactants goes downhill in energy overall to get to your products. Your product's lower in energy than your reactant. And in such case here, now all of a sudden your delta H is going to be negative. All right, so these are two and that's exothermic. Let's get that highlighted. Cool, and so delta H positive for endothermic and delta H negative for exothermic, and you should kind of recognize these lovely reaction coordinate diagrams. Now, these diagrams are nice because these are uh, uh, diagrams that show both the thermodynamics as well as a little bit of the kinetics going on here as well. And so from where you start to the top of the hill here, is called your activation energy. And a higher activation energy means a slower step in a reaction, a lower activation energy means a faster step in a reaction. And so again here, from where you start to the top of the hill is your activation energy. And it turns out you can look at it in both the forward and reverse direction. If we wanted to, we could show the reverse reactions activation energy, put it on the same graph here and stuff like that, but I'm gonna leave that off, but we could show it. So you can look at the reaction in both directions, it turns out on a good reaction coordinate diagram. All right, so we've got the reactant, we've got the product. So your top of your energy hill here is called your transition state, often given this lovely little symbol right here, this double dagger symbol. And sometimes in Gen Chem, we also call that the activated complex, but you'll see we're gonna really refer to it almost exclusively in OCHEM as a transition state. It's not that we can't call it an activated complex, that's still true, just for whatever reason, it's just not the common term we use. So same thing over here, top of the hill is our transition state. And just a reminder that your transition state cannot be it's, uh, isolated. So you can isolate a reactant or a product or even an intermediate if you have a multi-step reaction, but you can never isolate the transition state in a reaction. All right, so now we're going to take a look at bond dissociation energies. And a bond dissociation energy is for breaking a bond, but it's more than that. So the, there's two ways to break a bond. One is homolytic and one is heterolytic cleavage. And we're going to be doing homolytic cleavage. That's how bond dissociation energy is uh, defined. And here the homo part refers to that both sides of the bond get the same thing. They both get one electron. So in this case, if we're going to break this carbon-hydron bond, one of the two electrons is going to go back to the carbon and one of them is going to go to the hydrogen so that the result here is a pair of radicals. The carbon got the one electron, so it's a carbon radical. The hydrogen got one electron, that's a hydrogen radical. And it is the energy it takes to break that bond into radicals here, homolytically we say, that is defined as bond dissociation energy or bond enthalpy as a synonym here. And in this case, we say that this is equal to Four hundred and thirteen kilojoules per mole, and so typically there's lovely tables of all the different bonds. So carbon hydrogen, carbon chlorine, carbon fluorine, carbon oxygen, single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds. So you can look these up in tables. Now, one thing you should know is that usually these are fairly approximate because not all CH bonds are going to be of the same strength. In different molecules, they might vary just a little bit and stuff like that. So oftentimes, what you're going to get published for you is an 
average. So we're going to see that we're going to use these lovely bond dissociation energies to calculate enthalpies of reactions. So however, they're going to be pretty approximate. So it's not a bad approximation. It gets fairly close, but it's not going to be an exact calculation of the enthalpy like we might have done in Gen Chem with like a enthalpies of formation or something like that. It's going to be a little bit of an approximate uh, uh, calculation for that reaction enthalpy. So now that we've defined bond association energy, we want to look at some trends here. And so a couple things you should realize that, again, bond association energy is the energy to homolytically break that bond. And it costs energy to break a bond, so that's endothermic, which means then if you're actually making a bond, if you actually do the reverse process, that would actually be exothermic. And students don't usually have a problem with bond breaking being endothermic, but bond making being exothermic is not completely intuitive, but it is just the reverse. And making a bond definitely releases energy. The whole reason two atoms come together and make a bond is because it lowers their energy, which is why there's an energy release when bonds are formed. All right, so some trends we're going to look at here. So the guiding principle here is going to really be that the stronger the bond, the greater the amount of energy it's going to take to break it. So the stronger the bond, the greater the bond association energy. So, and there's really a couple things we need to, to look at that are going to affect the strength of that bond. And one is the size of the atoms. And smaller atoms get closer together, and a shorter bond is a stronger bond. And so smaller atoms have higher bond association energies. And we can see that here. I've kind of put a few of the atoms right as they'd be kind of related to each other on the periodic table. So here, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine. And we're going to show their bond association energies to carbon in every case. So we got a fair comparison. And if we look at the carbon fluorine to carbon chlorine to carbon bromine bond, we can definitely see that, you know, big differences in size between fluorine, chlorine, and bromine when they're in the same group here, but different periods. So, and as a result, there's big differences in bond association energies. So carbon fluorine, the smallest, definitely has the largest of the three bond association energies. So they get larger as you go up a group like this. Now, if you're comparing atoms that are in the same period, so they're going to be very similar in size. And so the real determining factor in that case is going to be electronegativity. And we can see that when carbon is bonded to a more electronegative atom, fluorine in this case, you also get a greater bond association energy. So if you're comparing a difference between atoms in the same group, it's about size. If you're comparing atoms in the same period, it's going to be about electronegativity instead. And so smaller atoms are, make stronger bonds and have higher bond association energies and more electronegative atoms so make stronger bonds and have higher bond association energies. All right, the other thing we want to take a look at is the difference between, say, a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond. And as you might suspect, the triple bond is stronger, and therefore it's going to take more energy to break a carbon-carbon triple bond than a carbon-carbon double bond. And it'll take more energy to break the carbon-carbon double bond than a carbon-carbon single bond. Now, one thing you might notice, though, is that, like, you notice a single bond is 348 kilojoules per mole for that carbon-carbon single bond, but the triple bond is not quite triple that value. You notice triple that value would be a little over 1,000 kilojoules we're only sitting here at 839 kilojoules, so what's the deal? Well, keep in mind that that triple bond is a sigma bond and two pi bonds, and it turns out there's not as much energy stored in a pi bond as in a sigma bond, and that's why most of that energy is in the single bond, that sigma bond, but when you break a sigma and a pi, it's not going to be double because the pi bond is going to be easier to break than the sigma. Same thing with the triple bond. You're breaking two pi bonds and one sigma, so it's not going to be triple the sigma because, again, those two pi bonds are going to be easier to break. All right, so now we're going to use these bond association energies to actually approximate delta H of a reaction. The way this works, you've got these bond association energies symbolized by that letter D, is you can either do the sum of all the reactants minus the sum of all the products, and that totally works. So, but oftentimes you can save yourself some time if you just do the bond association energy of the bonds broken minus the bonds formed instead. So, if we take a look at this reaction here, and I've supplied a handful of the appropriate bond association energies that we'll need to solve for delta H here. We could take all of the reactant bonds, all five of these bonds, and then all five of the product bonds and just do reactants minus products. And we could do that and we'd get the right answer. But we can actually shorten this up a little bit if we just do reactants minus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, if we just do broken minus formed. So, and the idea is this, let's take a look at the broken bonds here. So if we look at the difference between reactants and products, I can see that I'm gonna be breaking this carbon hydrogen bond and I'm gonna have to break this bromine bromine bond. And I can see to break the carbon hydrogen bond, that's 400 and 13 kilojoules per mole. And to break the bromine bromine bond is gonna be 193 kilojoules per mole. So, and then I can see the bonds I'm going to form here as well. I need to form, if I, again, comparing the reactants to the product, the bonds that are new in the products are going to be the carbon-bromine bond. And so that carbon-bromine bond is 276 kilojoules per mole. And then we're also going to make this hydrogen-bromine bond. That's new. 
and that's going to be 366 kilojoules per mole. Now, when we break these bonds, that's going to be energy that it costs. It's going to be endothermic. But when we form these bonds, that's actually energy that'll be released. It's exothermic. And so the question really becomes, do you need to break more energy in bonds or are you going to be making more energy in bonds? Because here's the energy cost, here's the energy release. If you have more of an energy cost, it's an endothermic reaction. If you have more of an energy release, that's going to be an exothermic reaction. So, but we're just going to take reactants minus products. And the reason we're subtracting the products values is because, again, these bonds are being formed, not broken. And so this is always the cost for bond association energy of, of, of breaking the bond. So if you're forming the bond, it's actually the same amount of energy but release least and the negative in this equation is already changing the sign for you. So if you subtract and then change the signs in the table, you've just hosed yourself. So if you just do reactants minus products or broken minus formed, the minusing is already changing the sign for you. And so in this case, we get delta H of our reaction equal to, and again, if we do reactants minus products, so 413 plus 193, and then minus products, we'd get our 276 plus 366. And if you notice, had we decided to, instead of doing broken minus formed, had we just done reactants minus products, then on this side, we would have had three more CH bonds. But on the product side, we would have also had three more CH bonds and that's why it just kind of cancels out of the equation. But if we work this out here, do a little plugging and chugging. This is gonna come out to negative 36 kilojoules per mole. So now we've kind of covered enthalpy and kind of shown how we can use bond association energies, which is common practice in OCHEM, uh, to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction. In the next lesson, we'll be introducing entropy and free energy and showing the interplay between Gibbs free energy, entropy, and enthalpy. So, and how to predict when a reaction spontaneous and things of this sort. Again, stuff you would have done back in Gen Chem. Now, if you have benefited from this lesson, consider giving me a like and a share. A couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. If you are looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, or if you're looking for quizzes or chapter tests or practice final exams for organic chemistry, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.